dialogue, coalition building with other networks. Um, for those who are just joining us uh, online on HowlRound, um, we're here at the MENA Theater Makers Conference 2023 fall. Um, I'm Kate Morhini, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here as a member of the Manatma board um, and also um, in my role as artistic producer at Noor Theater in New York, a company that um, develops, supports, and produces the work of artists by Mina Descent. Um, I'd like to just start us off with a, with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the land on which we're gathered today, the multiple Ohlone tribes. Despite the atrocities of colonization and genocide, native communities persist today and are active in preserving and celebrating their culture. Um, and I want to name that a land acknowledgement uh, for me comes with a larger responsibility and accountability to the legacies of colonialism and white supremacy um, and a, a larger commitment to working to active, actively dismantle um, colonialist and white supremacist structures. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, as many have already today, the ongoing occupation of Palestine and the genocide uh, currently occurring in Gaza. Um, I want to express unwavering support for the Palestinian people's right to sovereignty, freedom, and dignity, um, and support for the rights, sovereignty, freedom, and dignity of indigenous people everywhere. Um, you can read more um, on um, Manatma's website of our official statement, of our full statement, um, but just wanted to share that um, before, we, before we begin today. Um, and thank you so much to, to our guests uh, in, in person and online for joining us today. Um, I think this, uh, as, as has been mentioned earlier in the conference, the creation of Manatma was really uh, greatly influenced and supported by other theater networks and, and theater movements, particularly um, BIPOC uh, theater networks. Um, and so really excited for this conversation today. To kick us off with an introduction, it is my honor to introduce Amelia Cacciapero from Theater Communications Group, who has really been um, so instrumental in bringing our communities together um, from, from the very beginning. Um, and really grateful to have you with us to introduce, introduce this group. And then once afterwards, we'll give everyone a chance to introduce themselves. How y'all doing? It was a juicy lunch, nutritious <coughs> lunch, right? In yeah. terms of food, conversation, intellectual, whatever. The energy when I walked into the room was like <laughs> buzzing. So good on you. Um, I'm Amelia Cacciaparo. Uh, she, her, Sha. Uh, Sha is actually the Filipino. Uh, all gender <laughs> pronoun, I'm Filipino. Uh, I identify as Asian American uh, for political purposes, although Filipinos are actually racially not Asian or uh, Mongolite. So you can look it up, that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm with TCG, Theater Communications Group, and I'm the director of grant making programs. I actually have the great job of giving away other people's money. And we are so privileged, actually, and honored to be able to support uh, Manatma and this particular convening. So um, thank you, Kate, actually, and the producing team for inviting me into this panel and actually um, asking me to share maybe what's been in my head as I've been here with you over this last day or so, and years, actually, years. Um, and, and being here is resonating for me in so many ways, on so many levels. Uh, I was born here in San Francisco, actually, to uh, Filipino immigrants. My father came to San Francisco in 1931. Uh, some things are different, you know? Uh, and many things are the same. Uh, his immigration journey was during a different moment in time, politically, economically, and culturally. But many challenges and uncertainties remain the same for global majority immigrants who arrived in the 70s, the 80s, and forward. But the immigrant story is, you know, another story. So um, I went to high school here in San Francisco at Lowell. Um, before Asian Americans actually were the student majority and a lot of 
the foo 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 about race within you know that school. Another story, totally. Um, <laughs> November 6, 1968 was a life-changing date for me and affected how I see the world, my ethos, right? The night before, on November 5th, my cousin called me and she told me that there was something important happening on the campus and I should be there. For those of you who know San Francisco, Lowell is really just a five-minute jock from state, right? It's a hop away, right? So I was a high school student. Um, I uh, ditched classes after homeroom, ran across parking lots, and uh, I got to campus just in time as the um, police on horseback were being joined by police coming out of vans because it was a student strike. Uh, my cousin was there with others from PACE, the Philippine American Collegiate Endeavor, and all were shouting, on strike, on strike, shut it down, right? Really loud. Um, and uh, I remember running with a group of black Chicano native um, folks towards the student center, down the center of campus, and there's these police on horseback, horseback, right? Crazy. Um, and actually, to connect the dots, Ephraim made me think about this, uh, between then and now, uh, actually, Nataki Garrett's father, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jimmy Garrett, was then a student leader who organized several black student groups across the campus uh, to become the Black Student Union. And the Black Student Union became the leaders of the strike who partnered with the Third World Liberation Front, composed of PACE, Chicano students in Marasa, students in the Native American Students Union, which became AIM or became part of the American Indian Movement, and many, many others. Uh, this was the longest student strike in US history, lasting from November 6, 1968, to March 20th, 1969. And it changed academic institutions forever. Mm -hmm. right? When the strike ended, the administration, in response to student demands, established a college of ethnic studies, the first in the US, the first in the world in that kind of way. Uh, the administration also agreed to accept all students of color for the fall semester of 1969. Uh, I graduated high school early and went to state because I wanted to be there in that place with that energy. Um, sacred ground, actually, in its own way, right? Uh, many people have no idea of the sacrifice those activists made. I actually could only be there that day because I had to go back to high school <laughs> because of my parents, but other folks there, you know, uh, people did time. And that record, uh, that police arrest record is with them to this day forever. Relationships were stressed to the point of breaking. Uh, word would come back to members of the Third World Liberation Front and the Black Student Union from the police saying, we have bullets with your name on it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's real, it's real. Uh, in yesterday's town hall, folks were talking about power, taking power and empowerment. And this is something I think about a lot. Uh, it's worth getting actually a little bit granular for a minute, maybe about what power means and how we can use it. There are lots of definitions of power and uh, maybe let's consider two. Um, one, Power equals access to resources and decision making. Also, power, the ability to define, influence, change, or shape reality. Yeah. And a question central to racial equity and social justice movements is what power do I, do we have to create change? Big questions. Um, and since the 70s, activists and organizers have referenced four types of power. Uh, I have to give a shout out to PSAB, the People's Institute of Survival and Beyond, and Malcolm Shanks, uh, who is a great mind and brilliant. Um, so power over. Power over is how power is most commonly understood, how we see it, right? This type of power is built on force, coercion, domination, control, and it motivates largely through fear. It's generally concentrated in a single person or a limited number of people. And it's built on the belief that power is a finite resource 
that can be held by individuals, and that some people have power and some people do not. It may rule with weapons that are physical or by controlling the resources we need to live our lives, money, food, medical care, or, or by controlling more subtle sources, information, approval, love, and in our field, critics and reviews. So, power over. Power two is built on the unique potential of every person to shape their life and world through the body's abilities and imagination. It is the power to make a difference, to create something new, to achieve goals. It generally needs to be given by another person or a structure. So a lot of times organizations, our theaters, will often speak about, oh, we're empowering our staff to make change, but they have power over to actually negate those changes, right? So it's a really limited kind of power. Power with. It's the shared power that grows out of collaboration and relationships. Power with can help to build bridges between groups, so families, organizations, social change movements, or across differences, gender, culture, class. Rather than domination and control, power with leads to collective action and the ability to act together. It's contagious. I just talked about the student strike a second ago, right? trying to connect the dots here. Think about the 2020 protests and uprisings and how that was contagious and it was global. It was not only here in this country. Think about um, other things, you know, globally, the people power movement uh, in the Philippines that really took on the Marcos, uh, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> that's another story. Took on that regime. Uh, the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, right? Um, Iran was rocked by the biggest protests in years following the death of Masa, Masa Amini, right? A huge, huge political movement. Power with needs open communication and the flow of information between people and groups. This is the only power that can achieve group transformation, societal transformation. Power within. Power within is um, the only power that can't be eliminated or destroyed by power over. Power within involves people having an individual sense of their own capacity and self-worth. Power within allows people to recognize and activate power to and power with, right? It connects all those dots and believe that they can make a difference by creating conditions where power can be shared. Time has shown that power with and power within are really the only ways to affect deep societal change. As an example of power with and power within in action, think about networks as a net that works, right? Networks which center mission over organizational structure. Trust, not control. Promotion of the community, not self. Think of constellations not stars, right? The network as a whole is the driver and the force of change and success is collective. It's not individual. Networks support individuals to step outside themselves and their own organizational imperative and explore broader, more systemic change. Think of networks as global majority theater makers, uh, of global theater, global theater majority makers. Ah. Um, as constellations, right? Think of these networks of color, these folks, as constellations, mm. right? Theaters of color possess an abundance of cultural capital that manifests in deep and long-lasting community connections and solutions to the existential challenges that many PWI are grappling with. Right. What's not being covered in the recent press media articles about the demise of theater is that so many theaters of color are in fact thriving, mm -hmm. expanding their physical pr uh, footprint with capital expansion, making great strides in advocacy efforts, on the forefront of developing exciting programming that speaks to where we are now. But that's another story. 
<laughs> actually, actually, it's a series of six stories that are six articles that are going to be coming out in TCG's American Theater magazine beginning October 31st, and it's focusing on theaters of color in TCG's Thrive program. I had to put a pitch there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really, the articles are great. I actually was just reading the, the first draft of them earlier. Um, I've had the privilege of witnessing and supporting theaters of color through the years from an historic gathering of black, Latina, and AAPI theaters in 2003 at the White Oak Plantation in Florida, which led to the creation of CATA, the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists, and other coalition building. The 2018 gathering of theaters of color in St. Louis, where black, Latina, AAPI, indigenous, and MENA mm -hmm. um, theater makers pr protested a horrifically racist and problematic production with red face, yellow face, and many other forms of harm, of harm at Muni. And Muni is the oldest and largest outdoor music theater venue <coughs> in the US. Uh, so our folks led that protest and the walkout. It was an amazing time to be there. Um, I've also had the great privilege to attend the many gatherings of Swana and Mena folks over the years, and it's my privilege to stay in community with you all. Um, world building and world changing requires collaboration. And our practice as theater makers is world building, right? What networks of color are doing collectively is embracing a culturally abundant crew of people to imagine together in order to avoid siloed outcomes. To provide a dimensionality that you would not get with groups made of the same people. The stakes are different for us, global majority people, right? The stakes are very high. Working with and within is a cultural, political, and economic imperative. Working with and within can be the only path. I'd like to now dive in um, and, and have our panelists introduce themselves. I'm actually going to combine our first two questions because I know Leslie has to, has to leave us in a bit. So um, we'll start there. I'd like to have everybody begin by introducing their names, pronouns, locations, any organizations you're with, and also introducing the network, cultural movement, or theater you're a part of. What's its mission and role in the community? And if you can share uh, for you, what are uh, the biggest need or needs facing your communities right now? And recognizing that, you know, none of our communities are a monolith, and so, you know, none of us can speak for everyone, but just in terms of w for what you see as, as a need in your community. Um, and I'd love to start with, with Leslie before she has to leave us. Oh, oh no, we're having an audio issue, I think. Leslie, is your mic on? Ooh, I oh, hear it very softly. Very faintly. It's the volume. I hear her very, very faintly. Join Zoom from my phone? Yeah, that's that might help. Yeah, in in the meantime, let's um well, let's just wait one one more moment. Um, 
getting thumbs up from the folks on the Zoom. Okay, in the, in the meantime, um, let's turn to Meredith. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Meredith Suttles. Um, she, her, her pronouns. I um, represent Black Theater Commons, which is a network of um, folks who represent the African diaspora, theater makers, teachers, uh, and institutions, legacy theaters. And, um, you know, the, the kind of, Can someone speak on the Zoom? Hello. Yay! Yay! All right, let Leslie. Do you, do you mind if we no, let Leslie go? Just because she has to leave in seven minutes. Yes. Okay, back to, back to you, Leslie. Okay, is that better, y'all? Yay! 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 especially during this time of such violence in our world, specifically around you know, the Middle East. So, and I wanna share openly that I, I support and in solidarity. I appreciated your statement that you put out, uh, Golden Thread. That was important work and thank you, thank you. Taught to stand in solidarity with you. Um, I uh, humbly, I have been on the board and now serve as the board president uh, since just pre-COVID with the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists. And I'm grateful to say that we're rebuilding our staff, which has been huge, a huge development. And, um, and that includes a really wonderful, a couple of additions, uh, Kayla Kim uh, Vodapak and Jay Ching. So we're happy to welcome to our staff and our community at Kata. Um, Kata's mission, um, we envision a strong, sustainable Asian American Pacific Islander uh, that includes our native communities, a theater community um, that is integral to the presence of our national culture. And in the words of the mission statement, it's, it should be evocative of our past, declarative of our present, and innovative towards our future. And um, I can share that as we plan for the next uh, Confest, conference festival, in Hawaii um, since pre-COVID and now this coming May 24, it has sent us on some very deep conversations and um, structural changes around our decolonization and support of Kanaka Maoli and Pacific Islanders in the Hawaii archipelago. And when we talk about uh, what we're facing, we're facing devastation in the Hawaii archipelago, but how that resonates out to all of our communities. And to your point, Amelia, how are we really building this conference festival for continued coalition and solidarity building um, with all of you, but within our, I, I, the word diaspora seems strange now, but within all of our communities. Um, so that in the words of Nolani, uh, Ahia from Maui, how she talks about it's the activist coalition solidarity building that has really been the safety net to support those early efforts uh, regarding the devastation in Maui. So we took that as affirmation to keep going with this work. And um, I'll share too that I serve on the Professional Nonprofit Theater Coalition, and I was taught by my dear mentor Yuri Kochiyama to work nationally at statewide and local levels. So we are working hard to um, put a bill forward on behalf of the theater uh, sector, not just the coalition members, but for all boats to rise, literally, uh, for federal funding. But that also means we're working and encouraging everyone to work statewide with your elected officials as we build our safety nets and work together to share resources and learnings so that we can maintain our beyond survival to sustainability and thriveability. I think those are the, the, um, the strengths of our history as people of the global majority. And you all know me, I just can't help myself. I gotta keep organizing community. <laughs> um, one of the updates I'll share with you coming from our decolonizing processes at Perseverance Theater where I also um, serve as the artistic director and a, and a community member there. Um, we are working to uh, a Tlingit 
community-wide, we're working to get all of our arts and culture leaders uh, trained in Green Dot training. This came from, um, from uh, working with our AAPI communities around all the anti-aging hate and violence. Well, that was before, but it certainly spiked. And to support uh, working around mitigation of anti-blackness. Um, so we're working to get de-escalation of standard bystander and stalking training for all of our arts and culture leaders and our community members so that we can create a nonviolent uh, cultured community. And so far so good. Uh, we're working with the Juno Arts and Humanities Council to put that training forth. Because uh, we talk about brave, productive spaces, but how are we really equipping all of our citizens with those um, you know, tools and resources to bring that about. And we'll all continue to work statewide with, in Alaska to do that with arts and cultures le leaders that have had some of that equity and um, of standard bystander training, but giving the, the, the prevalent issues around missing and murdered indigenous women and people, this training is critical. And uh, we continue to also commission our Asian Pacific Islander native, and for me, Alaska native, and um, Kanaka Mali Pacific Islander, those stories are critical to be commissioned. We're still building our canons, and we know that in decolonizing and re-indigenizing, we honor the, the oh my good, goodness, the long-held, uh, um, hard-won wisdom of our native, native indigenous ancestors and elders who know what sustainability truly is. So we just continue to keep decolonizing and honoring those leaders and working in deep, deep um, uh, right relations and right purpose. Um, sorry, I'll have to jump off my flight of being canceled and delayed. So um, I have to go uh, work to support some relations. Uh, some things got pushed off because, uh, and so thank you. It's been an honor and pleasure. I'll stay on for a few more minutes. But um, again, my, my heart and my love and support are with all of you at this NEMA convening and all, all these beautiful leaders here on Zoom. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Thank you so much for being here. Um, continuing on. Oh, oh, oh no, I'll just go with I'll, yeah, yeah, go with, go with the Zoom folks. Yeah. All right, I'll pass it next to Jonathan. Hi, hi everybody. Um, so, I mean, for Meredith, uh, we get tag teamed in it, so okay. we both are probably about to get the exact same. Uh, <laughs> so we both help to run the exact same thing. Um, so, uh, uh, I, have the, I have the privilege and honor of being able to work with Meredith and a few other uh, uh, few other folks in the field around um, Black Theater Commons um, and really helping to build uh, that coalition up. Um, uh, my name is Jonathan McCory. I'm the executive artistic director of the National Black Theater. My pronouns are he, him. My spirit is a she. Um, and uh, the work that I think of when I think about um, this idea of coalition, this idea of what um, Amelia uh, so beautifully articulated and what Leslie has been animating is this notion, and I think about what my community needs in this current motion, in, in this current moment, um, is creating systemic um, actually uh, profound interventions that allow for us to humanize our grief um, and humanize the epic amount of grief that we as a society have been digesting, um, that many people of color, many black and brown bodies have not actually been able to um, uh, center or sit with. Um, the pandemic happened, uh, when the shutdown happened, when we talk about the pandemic, when the shutdown happened, um, the labor, um, the labor force, the labor ideology that has built, uh, that has built kind of the, the structure of how black bodies operate on this, on this land, um, stopped immediately. And a different kind of sensibility of understanding oneself had to show up. Um, that's a grief right there. Um, having to sit with, how do I identify myself without producing something? How do I identify myself without doing something that is a productive means? And how do, and what do I do with these hands? Um, if it's not actually uh, creating some kind of product. Um, and I think that uh, just as fast as they shut us, that we got shut down, the lights turned back on and said, now produce like you were previously and act like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of that psychic distance actually created a harm. That harm creates uh, a, a, metastasized, a metastasized kind of sense 
of, of, uh, of hurt. And I think without recognizing or creating space for us to actually deal with that grief, having a reclamation with it, um, we it, it then ultimately will consume us. So I think that uh, I think that there is a need to address um, the psychic grief, um, the emotional, physical grief um, that lives inside of the desire to the desire of of being asked to return to a world that never actually we were ever going to be able to return back to. Um, also dealing with the amount of uh, emotional grief that came um, during that very distinct time where we all had a very still moment but had life happen um, and witnessed millions of people pass, also um, even locally close to us but also nationally, and also uh, for black and brown bodies uh, uh, had a civic unrest um, under uh, um, happen <laughs> right in front of us um, where we had to figure out who are we um, to the society which we are connected to. Um, so uh, I think that I think that in order to address the craft making of the artwork or the whole building that needs that I think is so beautifully happening um, in all of our various different ways, in order to make any of that show up, um, one has to deal with the psychic walls that would divide us, and I think grief is one of those psychic walls that would divide us quite quickly um, uh, and quite uh, effortlessly so that we actually don't um, center uh, what I think is so possible and what happens so beautifully when we all gather, um, which is that we allow for humanity to be show up. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about what I feel like is uh, showing up in the world. Um, and I'm so grateful to be sharing space uh, with such brilliant people who I've been in various different rooms with, um, uh, co being co-conspirators on how um, humans get to be at the forefront of our Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meredith, did you want to? Sure. I, I mean, I will not as eloquently as Jonathan say that um, healing is at the center of what I feel like is the next thing that has to happen. So similar to what Jonathan's saying, there is um, a, a collective grief, a collective mourning um, happening this very moment um, in the world. And so I, there's a collective healing. And I think that uh, part of what the values of Black Theater Commons is, is creating a nurturing space. And, be, and so I think that collectively, as and I feel like the, having shared space with all of these brilliant folks, um, that's been a lot of the work that we've been doing, nurturing one another in this space, because it's, you know, it's heavy. Uh, the, you know, we are, we are in a world that um, doesn't cre create space for us naturally we have to forge spaces for ourselves and or you know or our spaces have been taken away from us uh and so or we've been displaced all of the things and so um being able to nurture each other where we are and i think that that is one of the the major things that I, it's at the forefront of my mind of how are we healing and nurturing one another um in the film Going back to the screen, I'll just continue along the, the circle. Apollani Attack, would you like to speak? Uh, sure. Um, uh, uh, greetings, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Opalani Attack, a uh, member of the Nanakoke uh, Lenny Lenape uh, Tribal Nation. And I'm coming to you from the other side of Turtle Island, uh, the, <laughs> the east side, the part of Lenape Hoking, uh, also known as New York City, and the island of Manhattan. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. I am founder and artistic director of Eagle Project. And our mission uh, information is to explore uh, the American identity through the performing arts and our Native American heritage. To basically investigate what does it mean, what does it exactly mean to be an American uh, through the lens predominantly of the Native American experience so that we as Americans can learn uh, a more accurate recollection of our past, a better understanding of our present, for a just and more inclusive vision for our future. Uh, and it certainly is an honor uh, and a privilege uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you. And um, this is, as I'm sure all of you know, this is, this is a really difficult month uh, for, for BIPOC and especially indigenous people. Um, I just wanna uh, just give a, a quick personal story. In the uh, summer of 2019, uh, when my tribal nation was going through a, a very difficult time, uh, during the last decade, and uh, you know, being a theater artist and with Eagle Project, um, I wrote a play 
a mostly one person show about what our tribal nation was going through. And um, outside of my own company, um, not one theater in Lenape Hoking or this country um, would help pick it up or develop it or anything. The only theater that did was a theater in the West Bank in Ramallah called Ashtar Theater under the <laughs> direction of Imam Naum. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so, so they opened our door, they opened their doors, they hosted us, um, some of the best hosts that we ever had and um, will forever be grateful. And uh, we certainly need to do more uh, now that they're in their time of need. And um, so uh, you know, I, I hope that the discussion is one of the things that we can, that we can talk about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Zahira. Hi, everyone. I am Kay Zahira Sultan. I am the current president of the Black Theater Network and also the executive director of Mind Your Business Arts. The Black <laughs> Theater Network <laughs> is a uh, combination of educators, artists, arts practitioners, students, and then also theater lovers. Um, so when asked the responsibility of the organization, I have, I, um, we are charged with creating uh, education and opportunities for artists in general, you know, and for educators. Mind Your Business Art focuses on the business of the arts because as we know, it takes money <laughs> and also structure to keep our organizations growing. Um, I just want us for a second to take a breath while we just think about what has been shared and what we have been going, going through. And, the, and what Jonathan spoke of so eloquently we are all asked to just keep going no matter mm -hmm. what, right? We, we have so many people transition and each seems like every week it's something different that we have to deal with. Um, so we are constantly on guard. We are constantly under duress. And um, art is a way of soothing that and making sure that our stories are in the front are told and some of us have even been told that it's illegal to tell our stories that it didn't it didn't happen for fear of offending someone else's grandchildren or someone's grandchildren my challenge as I thought about this and how we do this how we create this is we are looking at we hear buzzwords equity diversity and inclusion but equity and diversity and inclusion does not mean the same thing to everybody. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have a different definition of what they think that is until we can collaborate, until we can mm -hmm. come together and, um, and create the definition for what it, it actually is, something that we can all communicate in what it is, then we're going to constantly be on this wheel, right? So the blessing or something that I have um, come to appreciate is the fact that CCG took the time to say, hey, what do you all think about this? And brought us in the room and helped us speak the language. Because one of the reasons, and I'm going to hurry up, but one of the reasons <laughs> why minority organizations don't get the funding is because they don't speak the language. But when you got us all collectively in the room to create the uh, grant, uh, um, these grant, what these grants would look like, you gave other people an opportunity to share, and you spoke the language. If we keep speaking each other's language, if we keep coming together and realizing that even though we might speak differently, look differently, that we all have the vested interest it's important, we will continue to go through those challenges. So off my soapbox, it was just on my heart, so I had to share it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. Delena? 
how do we get our people in those rooms? How do we create these conversations? And how do we uh, showcase our beautifully diverse talent? So uh, I'm very grateful to be in this room with all of you to continue this conversation. So much of it, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. I just want to echo all the gratitude um, expressed by everybody else on the panel. My name is Jacqueline Flores. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I am zooming in from the ancestral homeland of the Nakata Tank, colonially known as Washington, D.C. I'm the producer for the Latinx Theater Commons, and the LTC is a national movement that uses a commons-based approach to transform the narrative of the American theater to amplify the visibility of Latinx performance making and to champion equity through advocacy, art making, convening, and scholarship. And the thing we've been diving deeper in this conversation over the last two years is uh, the disparity in access to funding for organizations of color in comparison to predominantly white institutions. Grant makers, and I'm going to share some figures. Uh, some numbers from grant makers in the arts. In, in 2018, only $24.3 million in funding support was awarded to all nonprofit Latinx arts and cultural organizations in the U.S., not just Latinx theater. And this is less than 1% of the th total $3 billion awarded by foundations to organizations in the arts and culture sector for that year. So that is a huge disparity. So we've been having conversations about that, and the LTC is a founding partner of the National Latinx Theater Initiative, which is working towards, um, we, we just announced um, the theaters, the Latinx theaters that receive grants from that initiative and trying to provide more funding for Latinx theaters um, so that they can continue to um, exist for many years to come. And in that same vein, um, as part of the NLTI, we surveyed Latinx theaters around the country in 2021 and asked them what their most pressing need was. And the first one was funding, and the second one was access to archival practices. When we, when we read about the American theater and what's happening in the American theater, Latinx theater, theaters of color are often left out of those, um, of the documentation. And so we've been talking more with our circle of scholars about um, how to disrupt this. And, and it's been happening for years. And people, like, the scholars who um, work with Latinx theater have been documenting it. And then now we're thinking about, OK, how do we uh, work with theater so that they also have the ability to archive their history so that as, we, as our elders uh, are looking to move on to the next chapter of their lives, none of that is lost, and whoever is able to come in and take over can still honor that legacy and continue to take the organization to its next chapter. So those are the things we've been focusing on. Thank you. And now last, but certainly not least. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Torangi Gazarian, um, founding artistic director emeritus of Golden Thread Productions, your host here. I'm um, here representing MENA Theater Makers Alliance. I'm a member of the board. Um, and uh, what was the question? Uh, the, uh, uh, the question is, what, what are your, the biggest needs? What is your mission and role in the community? Uh, and then what are the biggest needs facing your community? Um, so, I mean, we're in the early uh, stages of developing as an organization, very much inspired by and standing on the shoulders of our esteemed colleagues here, uh, learning from your mistakes and your triumphs. Um, and uh, I'm happy to report that we uh, have incorporated this year we are hoping to submit our application for a nonprofit status by the end of this year, and that will enable us to roll out some programs uh, next year for our community. Uh, in terms of priorities, I would say that we are still network building. Um, my hope for our organization is 
to become more representative of the diversity of our community, um, from Afghans to Kurds to Armenians to Turks to Yemenis and Moroccans and Tunisians and Libyans. I want us all to be able to gather in a room and um, hold each other and celebrate each other and share stories. Uh, I want us to get to a point where we get out of a sort of a reactive mode in terms of how mm -hmm. U.S. sees us um, and sort of claim, claim our own stories and, and in whatever form or shape they take. Uh, I want us to get to a point where we take license to do that, that we um, that we are not reactive, that we are not apologetic, that we don't explain, mm -hmm. we do, uh, and we claim space. Um, uh, yeah, what else? There are a lot of board members in the, in the room if you wanna add anything. Uh, certainly more funding, more representation, louder voice. Uh, yeah, power within and power with. Mm -hmm. I'm with you there. Thank you. So now I want to transition us sort of into more of a discussion mode um, around how we can how can we can support each other in our communities um, in addressing our our needs the needs of each of our communities how we can continue to build our connections to work together towards shared goals uh, along with each of our you know individual goals. Um, and considering the intersectionality of our experiences as people of the global majority, how can we forge partnerships and collaborate more effectively towards our goals? So we won't we won't go around in as formal of a way. Um, you know, if, if anyone has a thought, please please chime in. Um, I'll jump in with an yes. idea that we've discussed before mm -hmm. as part of our sort of TCG mm -hmm. um, cohort that we discuss. We, we we've talked about intercommunity collaboration and adapting each other's plays mm -hmm. to sort of decenter the white narrative and really push our narratives and claim that center space for, for ourselves. So I, I'm a huge advocate of um, collaborating on adapting our, uh, our stories and, and staging our plays in our, in our various communities. Collaboration, I already mentioned this, a collaboration between uh, uh, Native, Amer Native American playwright and a Palestinian playwright seems really right, mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we've done collaborations with African American community in the past, but you know, cer certainly there is a lot of overlap between uh, Middle East in terms of its history, cultural background, and its current political um, experience with everything that um, is happening in various communities, and I think there's a lot of room for uh, collaboration, partnership, uh, generating new work, but also adapting each other's plays. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Other folks, feel free. To well, when I when I think about when I think about the idea of collaboration, and I and I, and I think about the necessity of collaboration amongst um, amongst us especially us as people of the global majority and people of color, um, I think of really having a conversation, like the, the, the necessity of dismantling the idea of tokenism that lives inside of the Western capitalistic uh, model. Um, I think about this notion of idea of crabs in the barrel having to be actually dismantled as well. Um, and how do we actually, I ask myself whenever I'm getting into a space of collaboration, um, how am I uh, dismantling my ego to get into the sonic wave or sound of choral, of choral music making? Um, a beautiful artist said to me once, she loves choral sound because it requires for uh, the self to um, start to diminish to a place where it can take care of it, it starts to feel like it's tethered to the whole. Um, and, that, and, that, and that self being the ego self um, of wanting the I me to show up, and I think sometimes we, we, we champion, especially these folks on this Zoom, we champion for our culture so hard, um, so clearly, so fat, ferociously, that sometimes we, 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 can, we can miss the mark of championing each other. Um, 
And I think that in understanding that my liberation is tethered to your liberation. Mm -hmm. that, and that's why these rooms are so deeply important because our collective liberation is actually human, not cultural and not, uh, and not based off of one race. It's based off of how I think. I think if I was to imagine the folks who I've been in rooms with, um, I think that we all only live through the curiosity of how am I generating, um, how am I generating pathways so that uh, the, 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 the future me um, doesn't have to live in a binary, but gets to live in the omnipresence of their full humanness. And how do we get to be human in this moment? So um, I, when I think about collaboration across, across the cultural spectrum, um, I, th I think about all those things, and I think about where do we land in the center of all those things uh, to really take care of, um, <clears throat> not necessarily us, but take care of the future. Um, uh, and making sure that the future gets to eat and dine at a table that is that will surpass our wildest imagination, um, so that we get to be the great ancestors now and know their history. Um, I just want to add that um, I mean part of part of the indigenous experience um, in Turtle Island, and I mean it becomes also part of a broader American experience, um, is our relationship and interaction with all the communities that have come to Turtle Island, um, you know, over over the past, um, you know, 500 years or so. Um, you know, we have a rich, um, we have a rich history with the African American community, um, with the Latino community. And, that, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have established a very deep relationship um, with the, um, with the Palestinian and, and Arab Pacific Revolution communities uh, as, as well. Um, the, the Native experience, especially the contemporary terms, the, involves all these communities. And it's one of the reasons why we at Eagle Project um, have tailored our mission statement uh, in that way. Um, and so we have, we have a number of projects that I think uh, would be appropriate for collaboration with anyone from the theater um, that are present today. Um, so, you know, so if, if all interested, uh, please email us at eagleprojectarts at uh, gmail.com and let's get the conversation started. Yeah, um, I think in addition to um, the artistic collaboration, I think there's also very real advocacy that can happen. Uh, I think about in New York, uh, there's a coalition of theaters of color, New Federal, Theater Pregonas, and I'm spacing out on who the other ones were, but they advocated uh, locally, so they became a line item in the city's budget. Uh, so there was funding insured. Now, that is no longer happening for a variety of political reasons, but it lasted for a good long time. Uh, also in Dallas, there's a, co a collection, uh, a collective of theaters of color, Caramia, Soul Rep, and some other folks that have been really doing similar work in advocating for um, the budget process for theaters to ensure that they are going to be getting funded. So I think the work happens on a lot of different levels. And I think for, for everyone to think about what is my part of this? Is my strength, okay, I'm gonna do that advocacy work because I love the numbers and I'm gonna really hound you know, the local government or is it the artistic collaboration or is it the whatever? Um, because I think uh, there are so many strengths in all of our respective communities and we should work to our strengths in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, th I think the thing that sh keeps coming up for me is show up for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, the base of it, to continue to show up for one another um, in all of those ways, right? In collaborating on the, on the artistic front, also uh, collaborating in advocacy, but also in resource sharing, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, Jacqueline, you were mentioning the archival, and I was like, immediately, I'm like, oh, we'll talk to you a little later. Black Theater Commons have been doing archiving yeah. work for a long time, so I got you, we'll talk. But Let's like talk. that's, yeah, there's just that, you know, talk about your process, right, the learning, the, the, the celebrations and the pains that all of us have gone through in the formation of our organizations, but really just showing up um, because so often we're isolated mm -hmm. in spaces and, and that's intended to be mm -hmm. that way, right? And so the more we can show up in spaces for one another in support of the work and say no, Oh, you didn't know how important this is for this to be here at this time in this space and this, you know, we have to continue to show up um, in all of the ways. So I think so here, yeah. I, I, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. I mm -hmm. realized as we talked that I didn't share my pronouns, he's or hers, and that I, um, 
I'm right now in Manhattan. But I lived in Detroit, Michigan, which is the land Detroit. of the Potawatomi <laughs> City. And the, I actually did the research because I wanted to say it right. Bodawatomi, the Ottawa, which is the Ottawa, and the Chippewa. One of the things that we did also, uh, as many of you know, live in Chicago, but one of the things we did was we created a cultural bill of rights, mm -hmm. right? And we submitted it because of we, we submitted it to the mayor, Lori Lightfoot then, um, which she adapted. But if we come together as a collective and we create these policies, that's how we will preserve, not only will we get funding, <coughs> but we will also um, create some, uh, some outlines of how we move as um, people of the global majority. And I think that would be one good thing that we could work on together. We continue to collaborate. I thank you very much for inviting me to this program. It is just wonderful. So I appreciate that. But I think that we should come together and also create some policies and see how we can move the needle forward for um, to really make a change. Thank you. You ready for some more? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. This this conversation feels very much like a, like a jumping off point for for continued continued action together. Yes. Other folks thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Plus plus one to everything that has been said. Um, and yeah, would love to you know, gather us all and continue to have deeper conversations. And I just want to go back to what Meredith was saying about sharing our resources and supporting our work. That's ex what I had um, on my little screen as a note to share. Um, and yeah, thinking like about like, you know, in like very basic terms of like baking, like if I don't have sugar, who here has sugar? <laughs> like how can, how can I share the resources the LCC has or um, that that anyone may need to continue to move their work forward. And as an example, uh, we've been in conversations with Lauren Turner, who recently produced the Wheat Bowl Green Festival in New Orleans, and had a uh, Afro Latina New Play Fest like readings within it. And you know, she's thinking about the next festival, and the LTC has done numerous New Play festivals, and so we're like. We can support because we know we have like rubrics of how we evaluate say our steering committee is set up to be able to um, serve as a, a programming committee, you know, all of these things that, that we have had experience doing um, and we and you know, it doesn't like it doesn't cost us anything um, to share those resources and so I think that that's something that is really important to us and to me and yeah just being very transparent of you know if you're applying for a grant at a foundation that we've worked with like let me <laughs> let us talk about it mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. let's talk about um what those grant sizes look like and what their relationships look like so i think that yeah just hit it on the nose with that thank you yeah, I've been thinking a lot about about sort of inform resource and also information sharing. I know that you know, as I mentioned before, I think Manatma like really has learned so much from the wisdom of like pretty much every everybody in this group in terms of the way the way that things have been done in the past, what's worked, what hasn't, and so the more that we can continue to transparently share, you know, and and ask each other questions, right? Pose pose questions about about what we're doing and 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 share information. I think will be will be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to also acknowledge that we've historically benefited from TCG yes. national yes. conferences as mm -hmm. a gathering space mm -hmm. and a planning, yes. mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, planning space. And uh, I'm actually curious if this next year there will be an opportunity because mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some past years there was like an extra day for buy talks. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you at liberty to discuss any? Uh, I'm being filmed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, actually,
actually, uh, the next TCG conference is going to be in Chicago, June 20th and 22nd, and we are in conversation with the community in Chicago, Chicago Theaters of Color, to get their take. Uh, the pre-conference day is Juneteenth, so we want to be respectful uh, of what might be happening in that city during that day, but that doesn't mean that something can't happen or shouldn't happen. Um, so uh, we will have more information about that um, right after the new year, actually. So Great. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. We'll, just, we'll just stay in touch. Yeah. 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 Thank That's you. Great. Okay. Other folks have thoughts about how we might support each other, possibility for collaboration? Just, yeah, no, just one thing, uh, kind of just jumping off of Jacqueline, which you mentioned, just another person that comes to mind who's actually also in Dallas, uh, Teresa Colin Wash and the Bishop um, Arts Theater uh, Company. Uh, she is a powerhouse um, and incredibly collaborative mm -hmm. and has really done the work of saying, listen, if you're similarly, Jacqueline, uh, if you're applying to this funder, then uh, I'll be your thought partner. We'll bounce around the ideas. We'll work through the drafts. We'll make sure that when you're doing those pitches with the program officers that you have like talking points. Uh, and she's taken it on herself. And I think that is incredibly generous, but it's something that many, many people can do. The bulk of you all are based here in San Francisco and there is a wealth of uh, grant making that is in this community here, and so how can you help each other access it jointly and individually? Hmm. And there are also a lot of grant makers of color leading um, some of these foundations who are accessible, and there is a grant makers in the arts conference that actually is happening in a few days, I'll be there, uh, but just to stay abreast of the changes, because within philanthropy, a lot of people will say, oh, well, the funders, the funders, the funders. There's a core group of us within that organization who many years, even people before me, who have been working in, towards racial equity and funding equity. Um, and it's a slow, slow boat to turn. But there is a critical mass of global majority people within the grant making and philanthropy sector that are very, very much aligned with all of the conversation that's happened today. Mm. Thank you. Um, unless folks on, on the Zoom or here have other thoughts, I'd love to open it up to questions and thoughts from the group. Before I do that, any other things that folks want to share? No. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions and also just thoughts, ideas from the group in terms of ways that our communities can, can connect and, and collaborate and show up for each other going forward. I have a, oh, sorry. I'm curious, you know, I think we, we talk a lot about sort of, um, I, I think we were talking a lot about uh, uh, fundraising, granting, and how we sort of show up uh, for each other in, in movement spaces. I'm also really interested, and you alluded to this a bit before, about how we can support each other in our art making too. Like, are there ways that, um, you know, we've talked about resource sharing and, uh, are there other ways, I'm curious, that we think we can be in, in collaboration and partnership on the projects we're working on? You know, I, I can think of, can think of multiple, multiple projects that might have, have overlap in our communities in ways that we might be able to partner, but I'm curious if folks have specific ideas or, or pitches in that, in that vein. I just want to yes. uplift, I don't know this person's name, but something that was said on Zoom about that like we can tell stories that aren't intrinsically related to our racial or ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. Like I can perform roles that don't have anything to do mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think just seeing a critical mass of theaters do and create those kinds of opportunities for artists, um, I'm just uplifting that. That's exciting. Thank you. Hmm. 
think that's such a such a yeah. So just to repeat for those those uh, who might be in the Zoom space, I think the correct me if I'm wrong. The question is um, how how do uh, you know we're, you're just recently hearing about stories by and for these communities um, interested in in continuing that? How do I how do how do we start? Is well, I knew about the stories, but uh -huh. in this part of New England in particular, particularly what I was mm -hmm. in there, they're not being produced. Yeah. And I would like to know how to get started to see that these, these new voices and these, this talent is represented in New England. Yeah, so, so is, is the question kind of how do, we, how do we get more of our work produced? How do we, and, and I'm curious to, to sort of expand on that question, how do we support each other in getting, in getting our work produced? Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, for me, I can briefly say, I think that, you know, um, that there can be, there's, um, that, that each one of us, right, can advocate for the, the pieces in, not just in our own community, right, but in other communities, in the different spaces in which we, ha in which we have um, power, right? Um, in, in helping to move move that needle, um, but I'm curious what what other folks' thoughts might be on this question of how do we how do we support each other to get more of our work produced? I mean, I'll just share uh, another um, another story about during the uh, during the pandemic uh, when everything was shut down. Um, the uh, We Eagle Project collaborated with other Native organizations here in the East Coast um, to create Native Be Here Thursdays. And when we presented a new native play, I think about every week during the pandemic, it provided uh, um, not just um, a sense of community, uh, which, which obviously was, was tremendous, and also uh, work for the actors, but it also created some money and income for artists who had no other livelihood during that time. Um, so, you know, on one hand, it's like, well, what, what does it take? <laughs> well, hopefully it shouldn't take a pandemic where a thousand people are killed and <laughs> shut down for us to finally do that. But unfortunately, I feel like now that we've come, that we've started to go back to quote unquote normal, you know, we get enticed by a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the more affluent uh, white institutions, and people go to work with them, and thus our community gets dispersed, and we don't have that quite a solidarity that we that we had, and everything else was shut down. So I do think that's one of the challenges moving forward is how can we get that sense, that same sense of solidarity amongst ourselves. Um, even when there's not a, um, a crisis going on. On the other side, I believe I did hear you say you were from like Boston and Rhode, and Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're in New York City, and we have worked with a number of natives uh, from the New England area. Um, you know, some that were uh, Mi'kmaq and um, you know, Mashpee uh, Wampanoag. Um, so uh, we certainly have um, certainly provided platforms and resources uh, uh, to help uh, bring their work. jump in real quick. Um, I, I think yesterday, God, was it only yesterday? Yeah. Uh, at the town hall, one of the things that was talked about was um, the focus on hyper-local, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the local connections, the hyper-local work is essential to see who is in your immediate, Boston is a huge theater community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so to just see who is maybe at those theaters, who is Mena, Swana, uh, and might want to host some kind of gathering, and you start very local. There, there are a ton of artists, I'm sure, plus folks yeah. within um, theater staffs, and then it'll ripple out. But you got to start hyper local. Mm -hmm. uh, the one name I'll throw in the space is Megan Sandler. Oh Bacon, yes, yeah. uh, yes. Runs Boston Playwrights yes. Theater and is a co-conspirator with me on my directors and many other things. Um, and I just want to say that uh, what. Boston is a difficult space to move, I know, on the diversity conversation, mm -hmm. from many conversations with her. Um, but having said that, I also, because I know you're sort of coming from Armenian background, obviously Watertown and the community spaces there have been very supportive of Armenian. But we just lost Midwest. Ah, mm -hmm. Midwest yes. was just killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was a huge host mm -hmm. of the community spaces. Oh. I believe our time, ooh, we are a yeah. bit over time and we need to wrap up. So I wanna say thank you. I'm always grateful for the wisdom of everybody in this group. 
And so thank you so much for, for being a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, this was my, um, I, I take responsibility for this. There was uh, uh, something that TCG had shared that I, that I neglected to read at the beginning, so I'll just take a moment and, and read it. Um, it says, Dear colleagues, we're writing today with joy and celebration of the fourth annual convening, the Middle Eastern North African Theater Makers Alliance and the Reorient Festival. We're hoping your time together is full of care, connection, and creative inspiration. We're proud to be one of the co-sponsors and wish you an abundant few days together. We also write with heaviness in our hearts. Over the last month, the violence in Gaza, in Israel, and the Armenian exodus from Nagorno-Karabakh have inflamed wounds with deep and painful roots. We also know this violence ripples out to make people throughout these diasporas more vulnerable. There are ways we can offer care and support. Please let us know. The work you do is always vital, and especially so now. For while theater may not write foreign policy, we do have a critical role to play as proponents of peace building, mutual understanding, and liberation. <coughs> we can humanize, find common ground, and speak truth to power. We can repair and reimagine our relationships to each other. Thank you for the work you do today and every day. I think that's actually a really beautiful note to end on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.